من با اجازهتون برنامه رو شروع میکنم یه معرفی اول از کورس داشته باشیم تا ایشالا برنامه شروع بشه Hello ladies and gentlemen Welcome to the first session of How I Treat Solid Tumors Online Short Course I am Dr. Marjan Yagmai Associate Professor of Medical Genetics at Oncology, Hematology and Cell Therapy Research Institute of Tehran University of Medical Sciences And I am the head of the leading house of Iran North America Academic Partnership at TUMS. This course is a progression to how I treat solid tumors, and these course were found by the leading house of Iran North America Academic Partnership at Tehran University of Medical Sciences in collaboration with Hematology, Oncology, and Cell Therapy Research Institute. In this program, our well-known international expert in the field will focus on one or more distinct aspect of a single disorder and offer diagnostic and therapeutic advice. Our course, How I Treat Solid Tumors, is comprised of 10 to 12 sessions that weekly or bi-weekly will focus on various aspects of different solid tumors, diagnosis, treatment, patient education, and network development. We intend to provide oncologists, radio-oncologists, and surgeons with an opportunity to access the latest update of solid tumors. We have gathered the lead experts to share their knowledge and clinical experiences in each session. We hope this interverse can lead to a better understanding of solid tumors treatment. I need to take a moment here and express my gratitude to Dr. Sarmat Sadeghi, our invited speaker from the U.S. for his kind support and collaboration. If you wish to receive an international certificate of attendance for each session, you need to register by a praise to raise website that the link can be found on the chat box. Today's session is entitled, How I Treat Bladder Cancer. I would like to introduce our moderators for the first session. Dr. Arash Genobian, hematologist, oncologist, and head of the medical oncology and hematology department at Azad University of Medical Sciences. Dr. Mehdi Kardus Parizi, associate professor of urology at TUMS and chairman of urology department at Shariati Hospital, Iran. Dr. Reza al Etaki, radiation oncologist, assistant professor at department of radiation oncology Cancer Institutes of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Please feel free to ask your question in the chat box. Thank you all again for participation in, in our course and please make sure to write your correct name, the one that you have registered with and please try to keep the chat in English. I sincerely hope that you have an enjoyable academic experience today. And now let me welcome Dr. Sadeghi, Dr. Janabian, Dr. Kardus, and Dr. Ghalitaki to the stage and ask the Dr. Janabian to introduce our invited speaker, Dr. Sadeghi. Dr. Janabian, we are all ears. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yagmay, for the organization of this uh, meeting. Uh, I would like uh, to introduce my uh, dear colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Salmat Sadevi, who earned his uh, medical degree at uh, Tehran University of Medical Science Sciences. He has a Master of Science degree in Health Information Sciences and a Doctor of Philosophy degree, PhD in Public Health Management and Policy Sciences from the University of Texas uh, Health Sciences Center at Houston. He completed his, his internal medicine residency at the University of Texas Medical School. Uh, he completed his hematology oncology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, Clinic Cancer Institute. Dr. Sadevi joined the faculty of the Division of Oncology of University of Southern California in 2013 and has a clinical and research interest, especially in neurologic malignancies. Uh, Dr. Sadeghi is study chair and principal inv investigator of a number of multi-center clinical trials 
and is also an active member of SWAG. So Dr. Sadeghi is well published with several original uh, papers and uh, abstracts in peer review journals and uh, in, in inter international meeting. meeting. Dr. Sadeghi, welcome and thank you uh, for joining us. And uh, we will begin and start the meeting. Please, uh, Dr. Kardust, you can begin your start your case and then we, uh, we will talk about your case. Uh, we are waiting for you. Dr. Cardus. Okay. Thanks for Professor Janabi and thanks for the invitation. And uh, do you have my voice in here in the, the, and also my slides? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Everything all right. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. In this session, I'm, I'm so honored to be here in this presentation and this meeting so challenging regarding especially bladder cancer. Uh, in this meeting, I just want to talk about the special case, and we uh, talk about the uh, uh, therapeutic modality that we have for this case. And uh, uh, also, in this case, we will have at least two talks of uh, Professor Sadeghi regarding the update and optimal management of such uh, such case. Okay, let's get started for the muscle invasive bladder cancer. Okay. Uh, in a brief description, we have a 46 uh, year old man with gross hematuria, and uh, we decided to perform diagnostic modalities for this case. And finally, as you can see here, we have a, a relatively large uh, intravesical mass with invasion to the left lateral uh, Prevesical fat, and also as you can see here, we have left right hydronephrosis. So we have at least locally advanced bladder cancer. Uh, in summary, we did TRBT, and we found here high-grade urotelial carcinoma and uh, with uh, invasion to lamina propria. But because we have a large tumor here. Uh, we decide to just take a biopsy, not complete TR because this case was um, unresectable according to TR procedure. Uh, so, and also we relied on the diagnosing modalities, including conventional CT scan to call this case as a locally advanced case. So in this session, uh, so we have a high grade uh, tumor of the bladder, non-metastatic. We have normal lung. We have normal uh, liver, at least according to the conventional uh, imaging modalities. We have no retroperitoneal lymph nodes here. Uh, according to this case, what we can do for such cases is very important. And we can discuss more regarding this. Uh, complete TR and radiation and systemic chemotherapy is an option for this case. But if you agree with me, because we have a young, we have a healthy case, we have that, and our patient agree with us to underwent extirpative surgery, for example, radical sex to me. And also because we have, because we have locally advanced disease, if you agree with me, radical sex to me is the best choice for this case. But regarding the other therapeutic modality besides radical sectomy, no adjuvant chemotherapy and then radical sectomy, no adjuvant immunotherapy, maybe Sarah might help us too regarding this topic and also radical sectomy and then radiation therapy or chemotherapy. Uh, all of these options can be discussed for this case. Uh, before anything, I just want to uh, Professor Sadri to have a talk on the preoperative systemic therapy for this case and muscle invasive bladder cancer urotelial carcinoma. After that, we can have a discussion and uh, other colleagues may discuss more about the optional and uh, the, the therapy modality that we can consider for this case. Samad, please start your talk. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar for inviting me. It's uh, my absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, as you pointed out, I graduated from Tehran University, so I have an affinity for my alma mater. Uh, I, uh, I have a few slides uh, relevant to this portion of the case, and I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. It will work. Um, are you able to uh, see the screen? Are you able that's to fine. see? Yeah, okay. that's fine. Yeah. All right. So uh, before I start, uh, these are my disclosures. It's customary to um, uh, show the sources of support. And uh, the, there are a few changes in uh, various parts of uh, standards of care uh, in the US uh, for treatment of urothelial carcinoma. These are things that we, as we uh, progress through the talk, uh, will touch uh, on. Uh, so, and this is a layout of how uh, we see the uh, standards of care uh, in uh, treatment of urothelial carcinoma. For the moment, we are focusing on the bottom box uh, uh, of the um, uh, treatment that uh, we classify patients into cisplatin eligible or cisplatin ineligible. Uh, and then based on that, most of our uh, other decisions are made in terms of systemic treatment. But uh, let's, uh, let's look at some of the older data that are relevant uh, to this case. And uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of history here, but uh, it is still very, very relevant. So let's quickly go through this. Um, we typically, when uh, we are planning to do a uh, radical cystectomy, we want to see if the patient is a candidate for neadjuvant chemotherapy. And neadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, based on uh, standards, is uh, really based on a cisplatin-containing regimen. And I want to just show you where this affinity for cisplatin comes from and why we don't really like to talk about carboplatin and why we are so restrictive to cisplatin-based uh, chemotherapy. So this is the uh, one study comparing gemcitabine and cisplatin to MBAC, and not to be confused with dose-dense MBAC. It was done in a uh, metastatic setting, and I want to just highlight a couple of things on this study. One is that if you look at the response rate numerically, gemcitabine and cisplatin has the advantage uh, MBAC, as you know, is a 28-day uh, regimen of chemotherapy with a very complicated uh, schedule. Uh, and the response rates are similar, statistically speaking, but uh, numerically, GC has the advantage. The other thing I want to point out here is if you look at the curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves for overall survival, at five years, we have just about over 10% uh, of uh, over, uh, patients uh, still alive after just getting cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And this is a, an important observation uh, in this regimen. This study is old enough that you can be certain there were no reasonable second-line treatments available at that time. This is another study. Uh, as I said, you know, MPAC was very complicated. The question was, can we simplify it or make it more usable? The answer was in uh, dose dense MBAC, which is a 14-day regimen, all drugs uh, on day one and two, or um, just day one. Again, we want to look at this, and the response rate in dose dense MBAC is better than MBAC. We can't compare these numbers between trials, but within trial, at least we can uh, uh, be sure that dose MBAC uh, dose dense MBAC is uh, similar to MBAC or slightly better. And then we want to look at uh, that same observation that at uh, six years, uh, we have about 10% of patients still alive uh, with uh, MBAC and just under 20% with dose dense MBAC. So there is something that uh, creates a, a durable remission in a small but relevant percentage of patients. 
When you look at a uh, chemotherapy regimen built on uh, carboplatin, and this is MCOV, which is a carboplatin uh, sister of uh, MBAC, uh, versus gem carbo, which is similar to cis gem, uh, you see that uh, the response rate is much lower. Um, you know, we, we don't need to be a statistician to see that 36% doesn't really compare to 49%. And uh, beyond that, when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, this goes right to zero. So at five years, we have just one and two patients uh, alive in this. And uh, it's the same effect that we see with cisplatin-based chemotherapy, we do not see with carboplatin-based chemotherapy. So this brings us to the discussion of what do we do for neoadjuvant treatment and where this data comes from. This, this is a uh, SWOG trial from ages ago. It took 10 years to accrue. It was published in 2003, which is already about 20 years ago. And they looked at patients that had uh, T2 or higher. Uh, by definition, these are muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma patients. They got four cycles of MBAC and then uh, proceeded to have radical cystectomy. The control arm was just radical cystectomy and no chemotherapy. Uh, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, the difference is very visible. It starts early, the curves remain separated and it goes to 10 years. And uh, at the median uh, point, uh, the difference is 46 months for the group that got cystectomy versus 77 months for the group that got MBAC and then proceeded to have radical cystectomy. So this established the standard of care that if you're going to do uh, radical cystectomy, if the patient is able to get cisplatin-based chemotherapy, you should get cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And... Uh, as for the reasons that I just enumerated uh, in the previous slides, we do not like to substitute carboplatin for cisplatin. So a few words about uh, options in the adjuvant setting. Uh, as uh, as you know, uh, busy as the clinical trial space has been uh, in uh, recent uh, uh, decade. Uh, for urothelial carcinoma, we still have not been able to change the neoadjuvant standard. It remains cisplatin-based chemotherapy. The adjuvant setting, uh, traditionally, we used to do, just do, if we couldn't do neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy, we would try it in the adjuvant setting, especially if patients had larger tumors than expected, going into radical cystectomy with a T2. And then on you know, complete examination, we have no positive disease or we have a T3. Those are the patients that would uh, benefit from um, adjuvant chemotherapy using a cisplatin-based regimen. Uh, although the benefit in terms of uh, overall survival has never been proven uh, in a controlled trial setting. Recently, we have uh, the approval of nivolumab, which is a PD-1 uh, antagonistic antibody uh, as part of the Checkmate 274 study. This was a fairly sizable study. They uh, enrolled about 700 patients uh, randomized to nivolumab uh, versus uh, placebo. And the primary endpoint was disease-free survival. And they also had the usual suspects for secondary endpoints. And uh, this was a positive study. It met its primary endpoint. The difference in intent to treat uh, analysis was 21 months versus almost 11 months. And uh, FDA granted full approval uh, for this regimen uh, in adjuvant settings. So if you have a patient that didn't get new adjuvant chemotherapy, you were in the adjuvant setting, you can consider still doing cisplatin-based chemotherapy, but this is also available as an option. And if you have already done chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, then this will be essentially the only option in uh, adjuvant setting. Uh, the uh, the curves, if you look at them, uh, you see that they separate uh, and they remain separated. So even though we don't have overall survival benefit yet, I think it will materialize as the study matures and we have longer follow-up. 
So I'm going to stop here. This was the portion about uh, hairy operative uh, options. If you like, I can tell you what I would do with this uh, case that you presented, and then we can discuss around uh, you know, those recommendations. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Sadari, what's uh, your opinion, especially for this case, <laughs> for the case presented by uh, Dr. Karbust? So if we, if we go back to the options that you put on the screen, I, I can tell you that uh, um, I uh, come from a, uh, uh, an environment where we are really biased in favor of surgery. But this is not just because we are biased. I think data supports it. Uh, this is a young patient, presumably fit, with a uh, uh, clinically uh, key two or higher tumor. This is a patient that, in my opinion, should get neoadjuvant chemotherapy and get radical cystectomy. Uh, the options of uh, just cystectomy or radiation or chemo radiation, radiation is an option that... Uh, as you know, has never been compared head to head with uh, radical cystectomy with or without uh, neoadjuvant uh, uh, treatment. And uh, traditionally, it's reserved for patients that are not good surgical candidates. They're typically older patients with uh, you know a lot of comorbidity. And uh, in a, in I think in a most recent. Uh, uh, study uh, they, uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a uh, regimen of 5-FU mitomycin plus radiation was compared to just radiation. And in that arm, there was a hint of benefit in favor of chemo radiation, but that doesn't translate really, at least for me, uh, to seeing it in the same uh, you know, level of effectiveness and outcome for this kind of patient. This is a 46 year old and uh, by all accounts, uh, uh, no evidence of metastatic disease. And I would say that uh, neoadjuvant chemo and uh, radical cystectomy is uh, uh, my recommendation. Uh, one uh, quick note here is that uh, this, uh, we typically want to see muscularis propria on the TORBT specimen, and we want to see invasion into that. And those are the types of patients that we call muscle invasive and are candidates for neoadjuvant. But uh, sometimes it's not possible. I agree, this is a very large tumor. It's very difficult to just dig it. The bladder wall seems very thin, and uh, you may just perforate this uh, if you get too aggressive with this patient. So. But, and clinically, it looks like uh, there, there may be even invasion through the wall. So um, I think this is a clinical T2 or higher, and I would agree that uh, this uh, patient needs cystectomy, and uh, by that logic, uh, chemo before radical cystectomy is the uh, path to, uh, to go. Dr. Cardust. Yeah. If you have Thank you. Uh, I just want to talk about these points that uh, because when we consider the, the no adjuvant chemotherapy in comparison to adjuvant chemotherapy, we have two options here. If we have a chemo resistant case, we put our patient in a period of two to three months, at least up to four months for no adjuvant chemotherapy. This is the opportunity. Maybe we miss our patients to, uh, to put him in and the chance of the, the, the benefit from the early uh, radical cystectomy. I mean, that is there any way to find patients with chemosensitivity status to the, uh, to the no adjuvant chemotherapy? Because as you say, uh, um, uh, regarding the, the difference between no adjuvant chemotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy, the difference in terms of the uh, five years uh, oncological outcome, for example, our sororial and uh, disease space sororial is less than 10 persons, if you agree with me. The difference between no adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy. 
Moreover, at, I know that at least in uh, Europe and Iran, we used gems or cisplatin as a routine therapeutic modality for the, for the neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Um, I, I didn't see a patient that underwent NVAC at the first step, Professor Janabian and uh, Reza, you, you can help us that if we want to reach the better uh, oncological outcome, NVAC, as you said, uh, Professor Sadege, before this, NVAC is better than gems or cisplatin. But if we want to use gems or cisplatin as a no adjuvant chemotherapy, and we know that the difference between no adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy in terms of the oncological outcome is less than 10 in, in, in medium, I think that uh, 6% in terms of the oncological outcome. Can we put, I know that in guidelines, we have this uh, um, standard of treatment, no adjuvant chemotherapy, PT2 to PT4A, PT4A for no adjuvant chemotherapy. But I think that we should consider in, uh, and keep in our mind and that we need precise stratification for our patient to find which patient may, may benefit from no adjuvant chemotherapy. Can you help us regarding these points? Of course, of course, I'd be happy to discuss this. These are all, you know, uh, valid questions. And in this kind of uh, uh, session that we are having, these are questions that uh, usually come up. I would uh, try to uh, uh, separate these questions, dissect them, and try to answer them one by one. The first question is adjuvant or neoadjuvant? The fact is, in neoadjuvant setting, we have survival data, a clinical trial that has shown survival benefit. And therefore, it is, uh, it is something substantial and something that should be considered level one evidence and it's, uh, it's standard of care. In the adjuvant setting for similar patient population, similar setup, uh, the studies have not been able to show a survival benefit, and even meta-analyses that uh, were done, you know, combining these studies have struggled to show a survival benefit for patients that are T2 or higher. When you try to look at a subgroup that has a T3 or higher, <laughs> or no positive disease or higher in adjuvant setting, you may, you know, squeeze some benefit out, but, you know, uh, I think uh, as, uh, as somebody who wants to practice evidence-based medicine, I think the data suggests that neoadjuvant approach is superior to adjuvant approach. Then the question is, how do you know if a patient is going to be cisplatin uh, resistant or cisplatin sensitive? I think I think the majority of patients are going to be cisplatin uh, sensitive. The question here is how many of them can you put in a remission uh, uh, or complete response at the time of cystectomy? At least that SWOG study suggested that uh, about 25% of patients just by getting chemotherapy can be in a complete CR. And that, uh, that is after subtracting that 15%. So if you go back to that study, the group that got TRBT and then radical cystectomy had a CR at the time of surgery in bladder of about 15%. The other group that got uh, neadjuvant chemotherapy and then radical cystectomy, that group had 39% uh, uh, pathologic CR. So the difference is about 24, 25%. So I think that is still something to, uh, to think about. Uh, that is uh, something worthwhile. And I think just the fact that uh, those patients that get chemotherapy, they do better significantly, even when you look at different subgroups, suggests that bladder cancer may actually be a, a systemic disease even in early stages and systemic treatment improves the outcome when done at the right time. You have to also consider that by doing surgery, some of these patients may not be able to get the adjuvant chemotherapy because of the postoperative complications, you know, changes in renal function, changes in performance status, uh, or just 
time it take time that time that it takes for them to recover back to a performance status to be good candidates for uh, surgical intervention. So all of these arguments, I think, bring us would bring us back to thinking that neoadjuvant is really uh, the best approach. Two modern time trials, uh, SWOT 13, 14, that was reported, you know, two ASCOs ago and came out in February of this year in uh, in a journal. That one looked at uh, docents MVAC versus GC and gene profiling to see if there is a way to predict which regimen is better for whom. And that unfortunately didn't pan out. There was no way to predict it. And then the question of GC versus docents MVAC. I think that that uh, was kind of you know somewhat answered by the Vesper trial that was presented at ESMO in September of last year. Uh, they gave six cycles of uh, uh, docents and back versus four cycles of GC, and they concluded the six cycles of docents and back was superior. One could argue that those patients got a lot more cisplatin than the four cycles of GC, but again, that historical bias towards docents and back remains. Remember that the only uh, proven survival benefit in the adjuvant setting comes from MBAC regimen. And the fact that we have now included GC in the options of uh, near adjuvant uh, setting is just by bringing data and extrapolation from metastatic setting. So those sense and back for a patient that's 46 years old and young and robust, I would go with those sense and back as opposed to GC. My actual cutoff for uh, uh, for these patients is somewhat, you know, uh, fluid in a uh, perfectly healthy 65 year old, I would consider those sense and back uh, in uh, 50 and below, definitely those sense and back. And in between, it's a discussion of you know risk and benefit. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sadri. Uh, Dr. Gad Eteki, please uh, could you answer about the place of adjuvant chemo radiation in this setting? Dr. Gad Eteki, please. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Dr. Reza Aletaki from TUMS. Uh, I'm so glad to be part of this program. Uh, uh, first, I want to add uh, um, something uh, for the definitive chemo radiation or three modality therapy. Um, uh, for this case, I would like to know the function of the bladder uh, or the or the size of the tumor, I think uh, it was a huge uh, bladder tumor, and the presence of uh, moderate or severe hydronephrosis. Uh, and uh, uh, another important thing in our decision making to recommend bladder preservation would be uh, presence of. Uh, extensive uh, carcinoma in situ. These factors make uh, bladder preservation useless uh, because we, uh, by uh, three modality therapy, uh, would like to uh, have a healthy disease-free patient with a functional bladder. And any factor that uh, would uh, uh, compromise these conditions is would be a contraindication for bladder preservation. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sadari has uh, mentioned, uh, bladder preservation with chemo radiation is more a European approach, especially in the UK. And uh, the North American investigators uh, um, are more uh, in favor of uh, radical cystectomy. Um, we don't have a head-to-head -head comparison in a phase, uh, uh, phase three clinical trial to compare radical cystectomy with uh, radiation, I mean definitive radiation. Um, I, I think uh, it, it's not possible uh, to do such trials because uh, um, the retrospective studies are uh, uh, have been done uh, among um, 
medically unfit patients or who uh, had uh, had refused to undergo surgery and um, giving uh, i mean acquiring informed consent in such settings um, would be so hard so um, some maneuvers have been failed to uh, perform a clinical trial apart from that uh, I, uh, if i want to talk about that joint radiation um, uh, consider uh, many factors uh, I, again we don't have any um, strong evidence in such settings to propose adjuvant radiation but uh, there are factors that uh, would increase the chance of local regional failure. Um, among those factors, I, uh, I can mention the presence of uh, a T3 or higher tumor in the surgical specimen at the time of radical cystectomy. Another important factor would be uh, positive uh, pelvic nodes and or uh, positive margins uh, of the of the radical cystectomy. These factors uh, would increase the chance of local regional failure. I mean in the pelvic cavity in the cystectomy bed or in the pelvic lymph node sites uh, up to 40 or 50%. Uh, and uh, if the patient uh, experiences a recurrence in the pelvic cavity, it wouldn't be easy to um, salvage. Uh, it will, wouldn't be easy to uh, re remove it by salvage therapy. So um, some uh, investigators are in favor of proposing post-op radiation um, uh, in site settings. Um, for the uh, combining chemotherapy and radiation, um, all of the studies in the post-op settings have done radiation alone. Uh, and uh, if uh, the patient, uh, had, it would be uh, recommended to start with chemotherapy and uh, perform radiation in the middle of the chemotherapy cycles. I mean as a sandwich regimen. Um, this was uh, superior than post-op chemotherapy alone in terms of local regional uh, control. In a um, very recent, uh, not very recent, in a recent study done in uh, 2018, uh, the chance of, of local regional failure have been uh, absolutely, absolutely decreased by 30% with this approach. Um, in the NCCN guideline, the recommendation for adjuvant radiotherapy uh, is to be. It may evidence, but there were uh, consensus among NCCN members to propose in um, high-risk patients. So, so, uh, and one another uh, and so important things I would like to add is by advent of newer uh, technologies in radiation delivery, I mean using IMRT or VMAT, we uh, uh, have witnessed very low gastrointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal toxicities uh, by performing radiation. The main con concern uh, that we have uh, by using older techniques like two-dimensional or three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy. Uh, and these uh, advancements has made uh, many investigators to revisit the idea of post-op radiation. Um, in, uh, as in the last week, there were a new uh, guideline for target delineation proposed by uh, European and uh, North American investigators together. So if I uh, want to summarize my uh, talk, I would uh, say 
um, there is a group of patients who may be at higher risk for lo local regional failure after radical cystectomy, especially uh, those who are poor responders to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, who have a T3 or higher pelvic node positive or positive surgical margins after receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We can uh, recommend post-op radiation using uh, sophisticated and new techniques we have uh, to reduce uh, the chance of local re regional failure that may be uh, theoretically uh, increase the survival of the patient. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Cardus, please continue your case and okay. what was the next step for your case? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we decided to perform radical cystectomy for this case, uh, 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 but after the no adjuvant chemotherapy with the GMC tabin and also cisplatin. So we did it. Uh, so you can see here the final of our case. So interesting case. We have PT0, but in positive. This is a difference between the response uh, of the tumor to the to the uh, no adjuvant chemotherapy. We have no residual tumor in the bladder, but we have positive lymph node. Important question here is that we have a chemosensitive case or chemoresistant case. If you have a chemoresistant case, we have a PT0 in the body. If you have a chemosensitive, we have M positive. So uh, what we can do for such case, we have a patient with history of no adjuvant chemotherapy uh, for the positive lymph node, how we can manage, we can add some uh, other course with the same agent, we can change our uh, agents to uh, get better oncological response, radiation therapy result. Talk about this before and uh, what about the rule of immunotherapy for this case? I, I just uh, say that, uh, as I said before, we need again for a special urotelial carcinoma to, to find which patient may, may benefit from the for example, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, we need to risk stratify uh, our patient and also find the precise prognosticator here. So uh, if we take a look at uh, the guidelines here in a brief, if we have a, at least according, for example, uh, to NCCN guideline, if we have a history of no adjuvant chemotherapy, there is no difference between the site, the, the site of the tumor um, after the um, therapeutic modality, after the, for example, radical sectomy, there is no difference between the status of the uh, lymph node and also the primary site of the tumor. If we have uh, some residual tumor, uh, we need to consider nivolumab as a PD-1 inhibitor for this uh, case. And also, if we take a look at our EAU goal line, again, immune checkpoint inhibitor may be um, maybe a good option uh, for our patient, especially according to checkmate trials. But uh, in two slides, I just wanna say that uh, we need again to risk stratify our patients uh, <coughs> because uh, uh, for example, ac according to uh, in vigor trial, there is no difference uh, between the patient that underwent, for example, atezolizumab and observation in patient with history of the no adjuvant chemotherapy. Again, if we consider our patient and risk stratify our patient according to the PD-1 and PD-1 uh, expression, again, we don't have a uh, difference between uh, the, the, uh, these two therapeutic modality. But as uh, Saramat said before, if we, according to checkmate trial, if our patient could be included in the trial, may benefit from the adjuvant nivolumab as uh, we present in the NCC guideline. Here again, if we have, uh, if we risk stratify our patient according to PD1 uh, expression, uh, PDL1 expression, if we have a more than one percent of expression of this uh, marker, we have better oncological outcome. If our patient uh, uh, underwent the nivolumab for the adjuvant therapy after uh, this trial, uh, okay. Uh, Two months after surgery, we decide to restage our patients. Unfortunately, we found several bilateral parenchymal nodules in favor of metastasis in the lung and also retroperitoneal 
lymph nodes. So here we have a metastatic disease in a patient with history of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radical stectomy. Uh, in this step, what we can do for our case, uh, <laughs> Professor Sadari uh, will help us to answer this question. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I want to just point out a couple of things, and uh, then I'll show you some additional slides. One is uh, there was no lymphovascular invasion, I think, reported on the TRBT specimen, and uh, we of course didn't have any lymph nodes. We had a sizable tumor. Uh, that uh, disappeared in the bladder effectively after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, yet we ended up having uh, a pelvic lymph node that was positive. So this is very interesting. It's uh, somewhat unexpected. It's not unheard of. It does happen, but it was, uh, it was an interesting uh, uh, finding in this case because you can't really call this uh, chemo-resistant because the bulk of the tumor, which was significant, just melted away. And so by all accounts, this was a chemosensitive tumor and the adjuvant treatment worked. Patients that have uh, pathologic CR T0, PT0 after surgery and are node negative, they are expected to have 85% chance of five-year disease-free survival. And uh, but in this case, we had that node that was positive. So this is, this is interesting. I would imagine you could uh, send that specimen and see if uh, there is a particular clone that may be uh, in that uh, uh, chunk of tumor that is different from uh, what it was uh, in the bladder. Uh, that is, of course, uh, speculation. The other thing is that, OK, so let's suppose we don't know what's going to happen in the future in this case. What is the best modality? Do we radiate because there was a node in the pelvis, or do we consider systemic treatment? And I think our thinking, uh, it may be a, a US versus European approach, or, you know, but I think it's just the evidence, this level of evidence. Uh, as I said, most of these urothelial carcinomas, we have to consider that uh, they are systemic. And uh, the, the biggest risk of failure, treatment failure, is not local, local regional failure, it's the distant failure, it's systemic failure. And if I were to choose something for this patient, because the patient was not, not positive, I would say that systemic treatment is probably a better option. Typically at my center, we don't radiate node positive patients. Uh, we even, you know, if we even have a, CIS uh, margin that is positive. We have had these cases in our tumor boards and we have discussed them to death and we usually don't radiate them. We radiate for a gross positive margin uh, to just, you know, where we know there is residual disease, the knife went through the tumor, uh, we want to uh, consolidate a local control, that's what we do. But if we have you no know, positive disease and we're in adjuvant setting, uh, I think systemic treatment is, again, what uh, needs to be done in that uh, setting. So fast forward to your postoperative scan, we see there are retroperitoneal nodes, and that's case in point that, you know, this is really a systemic uh, failure, not a local regional failure. We could have radiated this patient and not really prevent the systemic failure that we had as opposed to uh, adjuvant treatment. Uh, the other uh, thing that uh, we will see through these uh, slides that I have is that there is a difference between atezolizumab and uh, other immunotherapy drugs. And the evidence is clear. If you ask me, can we explain it? We can't, but the evidence is clear that uh, these drugs are not the same. So. Let me just quickly go through some of the uh, immunotherapy studies. I have selected a few focusing on pembrolizumab and atezolizumab. I'll go through Keynote 45 versus Invigor 211. This is second line immunotherapy, Invigor uh, 210, Keynote 52. This is treatment naive immunotherapy in metastatic setting, and Invigor 130 and Keynote 36, 361 is uh, the chemo immunotherapy combination. So quickly, 
This is a phase three second line treatment for metastatic urethelial carcinoma. These are typically patients that have had some sort of chemotherapy, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy, and maybe even a second line chemotherapy and ended up in the study. Fairly sizable study, 270 patients randomized to Pembro uh, versus uh, the standard of care at that time, which was Paclitaxel, Docetaxel, and Venflunin. We don't have Venflunin in the US, so that's the European drug. Uh, overall survival was the primary endpoint. Uh, the usual suspects for uh, secondary endpoints. This, uh, these are the key uh, uh, data points that I've selected for this trial. Overall survival was significantly better for pembrolizumab in second line. Uh, at the median, the difference was uh, uh, the uh, median overall survival for pembrolizumab was uh, just over 10 months, uh, as opposed to, um, I think, about seven uh, for uh, the control on progression free survival. Not much of a difference, especially if you look at the curves, they're just, you know, uh, similar, maybe toward the end of the tail, they, they separate a little bit, but PFS. Uh, is not a very good endpoint for uh, immunotherapy studies. In my opinion, it's primarily because the response rate is low. Uh, response rate was about 20% for pembrolizumab uh, in this uh, setting, and the vast majority of responses, uh, and as I've uh, boxed them on the right side of the screen, they occur by three months. So your first scan is going to tell you if this patient is going to respond or not. Of course, response is not the only benefit. Even if you have stable disease, um, you uh, have uh, some disease control, which you know is something uh, to uh, to say about uh, these uh, treatments. If you look at whether PDL one expression on the tumor specimen did anything, you know it's all over the map. The response was not uh, predicted by, but overall survival. Maybe there was a little bit of advantage. All sorts of patients uh, and subgroups were, you know, looked at in this study. Everything, almost everything, trended or was statistically significantly better in favor of pembrolizumab. Uh, visceral disease, uh, nodal disease, et cetera, et cetera. Grade three, four toxicities. Pembrolizumab was much less toxic compared to docetaxel, paclitaxel, and renfluin. So this was this was a win-win uh, for across the board for uh, response rate, for uh, toxicity. This was a really good drug. So it became standard of care in post-platinum setting. Same design. Same type of patients, same setup, same comparison, essentially identical trial. This one, even a little bit larger than the study for pembrolizumab, failed to show a difference in favor of atezolizumab. If you look at the survival curves, you know, they just uh, are overlapping. Maybe there's a little bit of separation at the end, but that's not what you really want to see here. And same thing with PFS. Again, PFS is not a very uh, good endpoint. All sorts of subgroups were looked at. Again, no real benefit for atezolizumab. Median uh, overall survival, not statistically significant. Uh, response rate, uh, not really uh, significant. Uh, so why did this happen? Maybe it was poor uh, study design. Maybe it was the way they set up their statistics. But I think you know there is a difference between uh, pembrolizumab and uh, atezolizumab. Uh, if if we look at the treatment naive setting, both studies had phase two study single arm keynote fifty two for pembrolizumab. Uh, the setup is uh, shown on the screen. And uh, if you uh, look at, uh, you know, when we see these uh, responses, again, the majority of them are within three months. This uh, shows it by a number of weeks. Response rate may be a little bit higher in the uh, frontline setting, 24%, uh, maybe a little bit numerically higher. And, uh, and 
the bottom line for this study was that uh, these are patients that are not candidates for chemotherapy and they are still alive at six months, almost 70% of them, 24% response rate. This got uh, the drug accelerated approval. The, the equivalent of this for atezolizumab was even you know, better, uh, at least numerically. But as we saw in the phase three, they, they failed. So atezolizumab got into such a bind that uh, Genentech had to voluntarily withdraw the drug from this indication. So we do not use atezolizumab uh, in this setting. And as you pointed out, the adjuvant trial of atezolizumab in this space failed again when the volume app study was a success. So there is a difference between these two drugs. I can't explain it, but it's, it goes beyond poor study design or ambitious you know, setup. It, it may be that the drug is uh, different. This is in bigger 210 frontline setting. And if you look at these numbers, they're almost unbelievable. If you look at the overall survival, 15.9 months for uh, frontline setting. These, uh, this is, this is uh, somewhat uh, hard to believe, but uh, the, this was a study that was reported before their phase three. So if we uh, look at uh, Keynote uh, versus uh, uh, Invigor for uh, this setting, uh, these are the points that I want to make. Uh, for Keynote had an older patient population. Uh, they had higher rate of visceral disease. They had uh, worse performance status and they had, it was a larger study. So I still think pembrolizumab, even though they didn't report a 16 month, you know, over median survival in their uh, study for the reasons that I've enumerated here, I think the data on pembrolizumab is better and more robust. Uh, if you are interested in looking at um, a uh, review of all of these studies, this uh, paper is a good one. And uh, you can uh, look at uh, all of these studies in one place. And then we have uh, Javelin study. Uh, Javelin is uh, the study of a value map in maintenance setting. And the distinction here is that in second line, we do cisplatin-based treatment. We do six cycles of chemotherapy. We wait for progressive disease. When we have progressive disease, we put the patient on pembrolizumab. That's uh, the second line standard. Uh, Javelin, uh, a volume map study proposed that, okay, we do the six cycles of chemotherapy. If we do the first scan at the end of chemo and we don't have primary refractory disease, which means, you know, we don't have progressive disease right after chemotherapy. These are patients that we want to immediately move to Avelumab. And they did a, a phase three study, 700 patients, and the primary endpoint was survival, and they met the primary endpoint. So it is a standard of care. Uh, even in Europe, our people are warming up to it. In the US, I think in the community practices, especially people are doing that. I, I have some reservations about this. I prefer to do pembrolizumab in second line rather than a value map in front line for some of the reasons that I will show you here. This is uh, to show that the results of the study uh, was compared to best supported care. 21 months uh, median uh, estimate for the survival versus 14. So who can argue with survival benefit? Um, it's there. But uh, the, the problem for me occurs when you look at uh, you know, uh, this uh, setup here. If you look at the response rate, it's about 10%. In second line, we have 20 plus percent response rate. And these are, you can argue that these are patients that are selected for lack of progression. They may already be in some sort of, you know, partial response or even a CR, and therefore it's hard to expect a better response, but, you know, it's something to look at. And then this is, uh, this is the, uh, the biggest problem I see with the study that, you know, the patients that were on best supportive arm, best supportive care arm, the control arm, on progression, 
only 43% of them got immunotherapy. And almost 60% of these patients did not get immunotherapy. And it's hard to explain why, but that is, that is what uh, happened on this study. So the results are somewhat tainted. Uh, it's, uh, it becomes a, a question of risk and benefit. And the reason I don't do it is not just this one, it's uh, other changes in the standard of care. And I want to quickly show you some additional slides. In bigger 130, another failure for uh, atezolizumab. This was a three-arm study, atezo only, chemo only, and chemo and atezo. And uh, this, uh, there, there are a lot of things to be said about this study. They only were able to show some um, uh, progression-free survival hint of benefit. This was presented at ESMO in uh, 2019. And uh, beyond that, uh, nothing. And this may just be a cork of bladder cancer because the study of uh, pembrolizumab, uh, Keno 361, that was outright negative. It didn't even show that uh, PFS benefit that uh, Atezo was able to show. So it may be somewhat uh, different from other cancers, such as you know lung cancer and small cell, that we see that uh, combination of chemo and immunotherapy may be uh, better. Uh, we, we certainly don't expect that in, um, in bladder cancer. A couple of words about uh, antibody drug conjugates, uh, and fortumab, vidotin, and sasetuzumab, govotecan are the two drugs that we have. Uh, sasetuzumab, govotecan is in phase three trials. It has accelerated approval. Uh, I've limited my uh, uh, slides to those that have positive phase three studies and changed standard of care. Uh, sasetuzumab has not reached that level yet. So let's talk about the fortumab, vidotin. This is an antibody drug conjugate. It's uh, the antibody part targets nicotin-4, which is expressed on the vast majority of bladder cancer tumor cells. And then it's uh, internalized and lysed, and it releases its payload, which is MMAE, a microtubulin inhibitor. And it's uh, in its native form, it's very, very toxic. It can't be administered uh, <clears throat> as an intravenous infusion. It has to be delivered this way. And uh, there, uh, there, there are a couple of studies that are worth mentioning. Uh, EV201 uh, is the two-arm phase two study. One arm is post-platinum post-immunotherapy. The other arm is platinum ineligible post-immunotherapy. Both arms now have uh, resulted and uh, are positive. There is a benefit in this uh, uh, treatment. Uh, this is uh, the slide that shows uh, the, uh, the first cohort. This cohort, they documented that uh, nectin-4 is expressed on vast majority of bladder cancer uh, tumor cells. 125 uh, patients on this study response rate was 44%. Uh, percent. Uh, and disease control was almost 84%. Uh, so that is uh, really, really good. Uh, impressive uh, results. Uh, median, uh, this was a single arm study, but median overall survival 11.7 months. So this, this got accelerated approval for post-immunotherapy setting. If you uh, pause a moment and think about it, we have a second line option or a uh, maintenance option with response rate of 20% or 10% in the case of a value map and a third line option with response rate of 44%. So there is something wrong with this picture. We want to use our higher response rate agents earlier. So that's another reason that uh, a value map has not really picked up as the, the go-to uh, treatment. These days, uh, some of us do pembrolizumab EV in second line as the combination. The toxicities of uh, enfortumabidotin, you can't argue that this is a non-toxic drug. Toxicities are significant, especially with uh, neuropathy and uh, fatigue and hair loss. These are real toxicities, but uh, when you need the drug and the drug is delivering for you, you got to use it. 
this is uh, the phase three study of enfortumab vedotin versus chemotherapy. We always set it up against those attacks of pack and tax. So these are uh, our uh, go to control arms. And it was a positive study. Almost all subgroups uh, had a hint of benefit. So phase three confirmed it, and EV got full approval in this setting. The second cohort, as I mentioned, was for platinum ineligible patients after immunotherapy. And this cohort was also positive. Response rate was 50%. At median, the, this was a single arm study. At median, the estimate for overall survival was 13.8 months. And uh, you know, maybe 15, 16% of patients had to discontinue treatment so, because of toxicity. So it is a toxic uh, agent but it also works. So um, it's uh, now standard of care for uh, those that get uh, pembrolizumab in frontline and then on progress, progression, uh, progression of disease, they go on to EV. I'm going to stop here, uh, but uh, I just want to add one more thing. There is a study of pembrolizumab and enfortumab vedotin in, in uh, treatment naive patients. That study has reported 75% response rate. This has so far been mostly in abstract form. We're waiting for uh, the cohort to become larger and data to be more mature. Uh, so there is data that the combination is more effective. It could be additive. If you look at it uh, in uh, platinum naive patients, response rate for EV was about 50%. Response rate for Pembro is about 24%. You add the two, come up with 75, which is what exactly we see in the reports of that combination abstract. So. In, uh, in my practice these days, when I have to do pembrolizumab and I don't have a clinical trial that uh, is a better fit, I try to do pembrolizumab and EV, and that is my incentive not to do a value map and wait for that second line opportunity to treat patients uh, more effectively. So circling this back to your patient, uh, this is progressive disease, uh, those nodes, because of the proximity to the time of surgery, I don't feel that we need to recommend a biopsy. If this had happened maybe a year later, we could uh, you know, consider biopsy. Uh, and uh, again, be uh, because of the proximity to the time of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, this particular clone I would consider it, you know, uh, not a good candidate for rechallenge with cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Therefore, we are effectively in second-line metastatic setting for this patient. Pembrolizumab is the standard of care, and as I as I said, you know, if one can get pembrolizumab plus EV for this patient, I would favor that. Otherwise, Pembro alone or a clinical trial of combination immunotherapy. I think that would be. Uh, the, uh, the way to go for this patient. FGFR inhibitor erdafitinib is only relevant for patients that have FGFR alterations. And if you look at that study, uh, even among those, the FGFR3 mut mutation patients had the bulk of the benefit, and that was the most common alteration that was found and reported. So, uh, uh, I, uh, in the absence of that documentation, I think I would not consider FGFR inhibitors such as erdafitinib for this patient. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sadari. Uh, one question. Do you have any data about uh, combination immunotherapy in the metastatic setting bladder cancer? Uh, combination beyond combining it with uh, GEMSYS or GEMCARBO or enfortumab Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, for the past few years, I've been running a uh, clinical trial uh, uh, with a novel agent. It targets... Uh, uh, the pathway of uh, efren and F, you know, receptor and ligand. And uh, we have a uh, drug that was developed by one of our scientists at USC. I combined it with pembrolizumab and I reported the data for a 70 patient phase uh, two study in September at ESMO. Um, 
if um, I I wasn't I I have some slides, uh, but uh, let me see if if you are interested. I can see if uh, we can look at some of those slides. Okay. I would ask uh, to uh, our participant if you have any question, uh, you can raise your hand and ask your question at the end of the meeting. And if not, you can write it in the chat box. Uh, all participant, please. Go ahead. So this uh, this is the data I presented at ESMO uh, last year. And the manuscript is, uh, should be coming out uh, soon in uh, JCO. It's accepted for publication, it will be coming out soon. So this, this particular combination, we consider that immunotherapy, immunotherapy. Uh, the, the two drugs are, uh, uh, neither one is a cytotoxic agent. And I, I showed this, uh, this slide at ESMO, uh, it's interesting to look at this pathway this way, that uh, this efren B2, which is the receptor for this drug, is uh, present in urothelial carcinoma, but not in normal urothelium. So in a way, it's a very selective uh, target uh, for the drug. Um, and uh, this uh, study was for post-platinum patients. They could not have had any immunotherapy. The regimen is shown. It's the experimental agent that uh, Q-week uh, uh, interval, pembrolizumab at standard uh, dosings. We had 70 patients, uh, usual endpoints. This was the typical urothelial uh, carcinoma patient in their mid-60s. Majority male, mostly bladder cancer, uh, mostly post uh, cisplatin uh, based chemotherapy. And this was the response rate. So, in the intent to treat all comers, we had a response rate of 37%, which is higher than what you expect with pembrolizumab. The CR rate of 15%, again, much higher than what you expect with pembrolizumab. In the group, that had the biomarker for this uh, drug, if, if they had uh, FRNV2 expression, the response rate was over 50%, which is much higher uh, than expected. And uh, just the CR rate is higher than what uh, the response rate expected with pembrolizumab. We don't have, we have not reached a median duration of response. This is the waterfall uh, plot. And uh, the majority of responders are biomarker positive. We have a lot of CRs in this swimmer plot. If you look at the time, uh, we have patients that are reaching 60 months of follow-up. When was the last time you heard about the bladder cancer patient in second line metastatic setting, you know, surviving to 60 months on just one line of treatment. Uh, and uh, we have a few that have discontinued treatment but are maintaining that response. This is a single arm study. These uh, curves are for biomarker positive and all comer. Uh, we, uh, for all comers, uh, median survival is 14.6 uh, months. For FRNB2 positive patients, it's 21.5 months. This compares nicely with a value map and maintenance setting. And the difference is that maintenance setting, the OS uh, measurement starts at the end of chemotherapy here, it starts at the beginning of uh, uh, new treatment upon progression. Uh, toxicities, this is, again, uh, mirrors what you expect with pembrolizumab alone. So uh, this uh, combination got FDA breakthrough designation uh, in September, and uh, the study is, uh, has multiple cohorts. We're trying it in uh, neoadjuvant setting and frontline setting. And there is an expansion cohort for this, uh, for uh, previously treated, uh, to move it towards uh, accelerated approval. Thank you very much. We have uh, five more minutes. Dr. Cardus, Dr. Galeteki, if you have any comment or, or question, and uh, please, uh, the audience, if you have any question, let us know. Uh, Dr. Cardus. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Let's come back to our case. 
Uh, okay. Here. For this case, uh, we consider our colleagues consider again systemic chemotherapy with the same agent, gems or cisplatin again, but what about the results? Interestingly, we have complete response again with the same agent after the patients that underwent no adjuvant chemotherapy with gems or cisplatin. So again, here we have heterogeneous disease or your bladder carcinoma in comparison to other at least urological cancer. Uh, in follow-up, four months uh, later, we have again a stable disease according to our conventional imaging. However, a few months later that the last follow-up, we had here disease relapse. It's very important. Again, in the lung and again in retroperitoneal disease and also in the liver. So what uh, our colleagues uh, did for this case, again, systemic chemotherapy with, with, with the um, same agent, gems or cisplatin for four courses. Uh, here we have a patient with acceptable renal function again. Again, with this drug and the agents, we have complete response and a few months after uh, salvage chemotherapy again. However, Again, we have a redesigned labs after these two salvage the therapeutic modalities, again, in the liver, again, in the uh, lung. And uh, because we didn't have sufficient renal function for this case, just gemcitabine for the palliative management for this case uh, was considered. Uh, unfortunately, a few months later, uh, we lost patient due to the multi-organ failure and the systemic uh, relapse. And uh, finally, for this case, I think that uh, urotelial carcinoma, as I said before, uh, is a really poorly predictable disease uh, in comparison at least to other urological cancer. And we need novel predictors, for example, molecular classification, as uh, you know, <clears throat> Maybe be helpful for our clinical decision-making process for our case. Thank you for your attention. I think that uh, some discussion uh, might be helpful here for such case and the same cases. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kaletaki, do you have any comment or question? Yes, I, I would like to point out to. Uh, uh, new disease uh, as we uh, observe the successfulness of new uh, treatments, especially immune oncology drugs. We um, uh, expect the metastatic patients to uh, have a longer survival. So in the course of their disease, uh, they may have uh, a few site of progression um, despite the control of the disease in uh, the metastatic uh, sites uh, at the start of systemic therapy. We call this uh, context oligo-recurrent disease, or uh, I mean the progression in, left, in less than five uh, lesions uh, in less than three organs and a stereotactic radiation to the sites, uh, the control rate is uh, um, something uh, about 80 to 90 percent. And uh, the benefit of this approach is that we cannot, uh, we uh, can continue with the same systemic therapy and don't. Uh, uh, we shouldn't change the systemic therapy for this few sites of progression. Um, this context is uh, becoming very popular uh, and uh, we have the, um, uh, the facility we want to uh, um, treat in our, our, our country as well. I just wanted to add this uh, uh, point uh, so I'm my dear colleagues who invited me for this program thank you uh, thank you very much uh, dr. Sadari what's your uh, 
protocol of follow-up in both uh, neoadjuvant and metastatic setting after the end of the treatment? So, um, I think uh, uh, when I start neoadjuvant chemotherapy, I typically aim to do four cycles, depending on those sense MBAC or GC, it's somewhere between eight and 12 weeks. I don't do any imaging to assess the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, especially mid-cycle. So I just wait until they complete the chemo. If it's clinically indicated, I would consider imaging, but otherwise, if the patient is tolerating chemo well, if everything is going according to plan, I don't do imaging. Before surgery, uh, we do another set of imaging to see if there are any surprises. We don't want to take a patient with lung nodules to uh, radical cystectomy. And uh, the window between the end of chemotherapy and the surgery for our center is that we usually want to do a surgery within six weeks. And uh, we are fairly successful. By then, the patient has recovered from toxicities of chemotherapy, ready to do the surgery. We have done the CAT scan. Everything looks good. Patient gets the pre-op clearance, they go to surgery. After surgery, depending on what we see on the pathology specimen, if, if, I have, if I still have residual disease, I definitely want to scan the patients every three months uh, for the first couple of years, uh, regardless of whether I do, uh, whether I do adjuvant uh, treatment or not. And, uh, but if I have a pathologic T0 and uh, the nodes are negative. So these are, like I said, these are patients that have excellent uh, outcome based on the results of multiple trials. Uh, I would consider, you know, something like uh, uh, one year or four months and then move to six months. And maybe after uh, the third year, I just do one scan a year uh, to five years. So it's not as rigorous. In terms of what I do for imaging, I definitely CT, abdomen, and pelvis with and without contrast. And uh, NCCN guidelines, they suggest a, CT, uh, a chest X-ray could be uh, sufficient, but uh, when I have the patient on the table getting contrast with CT, abdomen, and pelvis, I just go all the way up the chest and uh, include that. In the chest. You could argue that CT abdomen covers the base of the lungs, and that's where the majority of the Mets are, but, um, you know, we have had uh, different uh, scenarios. So that's what I do, CT chest abdomen and pelvis with uh, contrast. And uh, what about the place of PET scan in your routine practice? Right. So uh, I, I don't routinely use PET scan. PET scan becomes, uh, you know, relevant in certain occasions. If you have something that uh, uh, is in a really difficult place or unusual place, I've had a couple of cases where I, I had a postoperative node, you know, two centimeter in size, right over you know celiac plexus or sitting over the aorta so some very difficult spot to biopsy and i've done pet scans uh, in those cases to see if it's worth doing a, uh, a biopsy but uh, not as a matter of routine if i have a patient that is allergic to contrast can't get contrast for you know whatever reason and there is something that i'm worried about on imaging then yes i, I do a one-time pets to see what the status of it is and uh, we'll go from there. But usually for nodes that are pathologic, so one to 1.5 centimeter in size or larger. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions from uh, audience. Please, uh, Dr. Yarmey, uh, if there is a question. Uh, Dr. Sadev, I have a question. Uh, do you also consider tumor profiling for advanced or metastatic bladder cancer or not? Uh, yes. So uh, because we have a drug in you know, that's, uh that's appropriate for FGFR-altered patients, yes. Uh, when we are in metastatic setting, uh, I do send it. And is there some clinical trials that you can use off-label uh, drugs for bladder cancer or not? 
So, you know, uh, all of these other ideas, uh, they unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of mileage, uh, you know, cabazantinib, you know, targeting, a uh, bunch of targeting agents, they have not done well in uh, bladder. Uh, uh, so in short, no, and even PDL1 assessment, because if the data is all over the map, depending on what drug and what assay uh, they use, uh, unlike lung cancer where you do uh, PDL1 analysis, I, I don't do it, and most clinicians like me don't. And if the PDL1 is negative, do you also consider TMB high as a candidate for immunotherapy? Right, those are proxies, uh, tumor mutational burden or MSI high, or you know, it's, you you could see uh, some uh, glimmer of hope in that. But I think the decision to do immunotherapy is made before you even you know get to look at those uh, decisions. If you have a patient with you know ugly cancer in second line. I don't, you, you just do immunotherapy. You don't need the additional information. If you're in the front line and if you really are thinking about immunotherapy, that implies the patient may not be a candidate for chemotherapy. So again, uh, even FDA withdrew that guideline that they had uh, based on Invigor 130 and the failure of uh, Atezo in as monotherapy, FDA uh, initially uh, released a advisory note that if you're going to do immunotherapy in frontline, those patients have to be PDL1 expressing patients. But uh, after the results of uh, importumab bedotin came and after they granted full approval to pembrolizumab in chemo naive patients, chemo ineligible patients, they withdrew that. So these days, if you have to do PEMBRO in frontline, you can do it without having the PDL1 uh, status. So, if you really want to prognosticate, you may look at those things, but uh, in, as a pragmatic approach or in, for practical purposes, if you have to do it, you just do it. Okay. Dr. Janabian, there is a question from Dr. Rezai in the chat box. Can you answer the question from Dr. Sadeh? Okay, so I think question is, uh, let's see, uh, bladder preservation approach, can we use immunotherapy after chemotherapy, chemoradiotherapy as adjuvant? So uh, I think you have to extrapolate that data. If, uh, if you have to, you do it. But uh, in, in post-radical cystectomy setting, we usually make that decision based on pathology report. Uh, which shows no it's positive or there's residual cancer in the tumor. After chemo radiation, you don't have that information. So it would be difficult uh, to say it. And if you have some pathologic looking node after all of the chemo and radiation, you may in fact be in metastatic setting rather than adjuvant setting. So it's a little bit difficult to, you know, to decide in, in that setting. So I, I wouldn't make it a rule. I would just say, you know, use your best judgment as you review the available uh, uh, patient uh, data and make a decision which setting you're in. And then uh, the next question is for renal failure and MIBC as the adjuvant role for carboplatin instead of cisplatin. So at the beginning of the talk, I, I showed some data to, uh, to demonstrate why we don't like carboplatin as a substitute for cisplatin. In most cancers, I think uh, clinicians use them uh, and substitute uh, carbo for cis. If you're doing it for toxicity, in, uh, in reality, I don't see much of a difference in terms of toxicity. Uh, it's even more, uh, more uh, marrow suppressive than uh, cisplatin. The only advantage is, uh, you know, renal toxicity may be a little bit more pronounced with uh, cisplatin. But uh, we have data from our center that uh, down to uh, EGFR of 40, that is not, uh, that does not add significant toxicity. So in my practice, I go down to 40 and do full dose uh, cisplatin-based uh, chemotherapy. 
And final question is, uh, should we use MRI with contrast for initial staging to rule out uh, periviscal uh, lymph, uh, lymphadenopathy? So uh, it is a modality that's getting better. You can, uh, uh, in this case, for instance, that uh, we had, I think if you do an MRI of pelvis, you can uh, see uh, that the tumor is invading through the muscle maybe a little bit better. It's getting a little bit uh, more specific. But again, for practical purposes, uh, if your intent is to do uh, radical cystectomy, those little nodes, when you take them out, their status is more important after you've done your neadjuvant chemotherapy and you will have that status on the pathology report. So I don't see how having that on uh, the MRI prior to your treatment decision would influence your treatment decision. And if you have a uh, extra pelvic node that's pathologic two centimeters in size, then you got to question whether that patient is really in metastatic setting rather than locally advanced uh, and a candidate. If you further clarify your question, I'm happy to discuss it more. But we typically, for prostate cancers, we do a lot of uh, MRIs. For bladder cancer, we typically just do a CT abdomen, pelvis, and that's, uh, that's enough for us. Okay, Thank you very you. much. Mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of uh, our Society, Iranian Society of Medical Oncology and Hematology, I would like to thank you, Dr. Sadari, and I, I would like to invite you for our annual meeting uh, uh, in the next uh, few months. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yarmai, and thank you very much, Dr. Cardus and Dr. Ghalde Khaki. Thank it was you my so pleasure. Much. It was very uh, nice to be uh, part of your uh, group and uh, participate in this uh, discussion. Okay, sincerely thank our speakers and moderators. Collaboration with all of you is an honor for us. Thank you, Dr. Sadeli, for your fabulous lecture, our moderators for interesting case and discussion. I am also grateful for the participation of all of you in the first session of How I Treat Solid Tumors. Have an enjoyable time. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.